Hello, Liza. Thank you for Hello. joining us. Nice uh, so you. happy uh, holiday shopping season, 2017. <laughs> I guess my first question is, shouldn't you be in a fulfillment center somewhere, like coordinating traffic and triaging? And... Uh, this is my clone. OK, I see. The real me is actually packing boxes right now. <laughs> I would assume. Uh, how's, how's everything going? It's, it's been great. Um, it, is the, it is both the most wonderful and the craziest time of year if you work in retail. So it's pretty I can exciting. Imagine. Well, for folks who don't know, why don't you tell us what your kind of domain is? Because you're president of Jet.com. Jet is owned by Walmart. What are your responsibilities? Uh, so I run Jet on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's the whole fun soup to nuts P&L. So everything from how we market to what the product is to what assortment we sell to the service levels in our supply chain. Those are all questions on my list of questions to ask you. What What is Jet.com? Because Walmart, you know, does a pretty good job of offering, uh, you know, an extensive array of, uh, of, of merchandise. So where do you guys see, you know, some people were surprised that Jet continued to, you know, to, to operate after the acquisition last year. You know, what do you see as Jet's role in the combined? Uh... Yeah, I mean, we actually play a really interesting role because um, Walmart, when you sort of think about uh, its mass and scale, you know, sort of gross order of magnitude, it's about... 16% of US retail spend, which is significant, significant by anyone's standards. Um, but there are definitely pockets um, in the US, particularly in urban, more affluent areas, where that penetration rate is not the same. Um, and from our early days, and I, I hate to ever use the word historical about Jet, because we've been live, like to three consumer years old. For, live to consumer for two years. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking about like a longitudinal time series, like that's not a massive history. But since launch, the places where we've always resonated the best were with those urban, more affluent, um, some spikes in millennials and boomers. Um, and so it's given us this great opportunity to actually focus in and really, you know, put all of our energy into like winning the hearts and minds in cities. Um, and that's been great because it's super complimentary to Walmart, um, and not just with consumers, also with some brands that maybe historically have been a little shy about going on the Walmart platform. Right, right. Uh, so to put this in further context, so you, you operate Jet.com, you report to Mark Laurie, who runs all of Walmart.com's e-commerce operations. How, how often are you going to Bentonville and meeting Doug McMillan and the Walmart senior team? Uh, so I'm in Bentonville, I don't know, every six weeks or so. Um, most of e-commerce is really split between our lovely office in downtown Hoboken, um, and two offices out here in San Bruno and Sunnyvale. Um, and so probably spend more of my time between those two offices than in Bentonville, per se. But um, it is charming. There was a big question last summer when Walmart made the acquisition that went it was something you know, like, was Jet sustainable? Uh -huh. Right? Was it a sustainable business, or was it, you know, was it rescued in, in, in some ways by Walmart? Um, it was obviously spending very visibly to obtain customers. Sure. Was the business back then on sound footing? Um, I think it was on very sound footing, but it was on very sound footing for the mission it was on at that time, um, which was super high growth for new consumers. One of the big shifts we've made this year, as we've you know, gotten deeper into that, again, let's not pretend it's super longitudinal data, um, is some of the shift in our marketing spend to focus more on existing customers and kind of getting the rinse and repeat there. Um, and that has proven extremely fruitful. Um, but I also think one of the things that became apparent to us post acquisition is that when you are part of the price leader, um, it makes sense to occupy a slightly different space. Um, and so we've done things like upgrade our assortment to be more premium. Um, we've announced some of the speeding up of delivery. You saw the acquisition of Parcel, some of the other acquisitions we've made across e-commerce are particularly useful in the sort of you know jet space. So we launched ModCloth on Jet. We're launching Bonobos early next year. Um, and those are kind of all part of one kind of single thread on a mission. Uh, and that makes sense in the Walmart context. People ask me this question all the time, like, would you be doing these things? I'm like, I don't know, it's a hypothetical. 
we'd, we'd spend half our time out in the road raising money, so we'd right. probably do a lot of things. You did very well at that. How, how big of a business now is, is the Jet.com piece? Uh, we do not break out. That we only report across e-commerce, but I'm happy to give you Brett Big's cell phone number if you can convince yeah, him. Yeah, I'll make that call. So, um, he's our CFO. We're, people probably remember the, the the subway ads, the bus ads. Yeah. Like, have you have you had to pull back on the customer acquisition piece? Well, what we've done, and actually we do, if you are in, actually, and in and around San Francisco, they're all over the place. I still see them, yeah. Um, what we've done is we've continued that press for customer acquisition, but we've targeted more... Um, in urban areas rather than everywhere. So as an example, um, we've pulled back on national television and we're doing more targeted buys where we have seen you know, great um, success in kind of combining multi-channel. We're focusing a lot of that spend in concentrated areas as opposed to blanketing the US. When Jet first launched, there was a unique proposition for customers. There, well, first, it, at the very beginning, it was a subscription service. Um, there was, a, there was a, a, a user proposition around consolidating products in a cart and getting yeah. discounts, different ways to get discounts. How much of that remains? And do you still, I mean, you mentioned differentiated in terms of some of the assortment, but is Jet still, you think, a unique yeah. uh, um, destination? So we still very much do that, and we see consumers using, um, I'll put this in quotation marks, smart cart technology, which is the thing that allows us to, this is like the sexiness of supply chain re-engineering, so you can start fanning yourselves now. <laughs> um, as you are adding things to your cart in real time, we are dynamically switching out the combination of suppliers through a proprietary algorithm that allows us to shorten the distance ship and reduce the number of shipments and then we pass on those savings to consumers. We are still doing that, and we're still adding new ways to save. I, two notes about that that are really important. One, part of what we are using it for now is to aid discovery in new categories. So think about creating a migration for consumers who are buying lots of health and beauty, and we can introduce new premium beauty products. So if it's your seventh or eighth item in basket, we can probably give it to you at a much more compelling value than if it's your first item in basket, and we're using that savings engine to do that. But secondly, we've applied that thinking across broader Walmart e-com. So if you look at the ship, you know, in-store pickup discount that we've deployed on walmart.com, that's that same supply chain re-engineering thinking, which is, you know, as we know, the last mile is a, I'm gonna say bear. Well, that's not the word I use internally. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, actually allowing consumers to help you take out that last mile cost when 90% of Americans live within 10 miles of a Walmart is like good for the consumer, it's good for the company, it's good for the environment. There are a whole host of... So, so that suggests that Jet is fully integrated with behind the scenes with the Walmart supply chain? Like you have merchandise in Walmart FCs? Uh, we do. So I would think about it a little bit differently. So we, um, we had a three, I'll call it three and a half node system when we got acquired. There was a six node sortable network for Walmart e-com. Um, and we now have one nine node system. Uh, and that is fully integrated. And the places where we thought about integrating first were really supply chain, um, sourcing, some of the, I would call it more corporate functions like payments processing. Um, and it was fantastic because I know people asked us a lot about this at the time we got acquired, you know, like sort of what's in it for you guys other than not having to raise money anymore. Um, and a big part of the value proposition and vision for Jet from day one was all of these really dramatically improved unit economics when you're at scale. Well, when you join the world's largest retailer, you get to scale Pretty like quick. that yeah. on a lot of those things. And it's allowed us to both free up capital, but also free up resources to work on things like customer experience, marketing, merchandising, mm -hmm. that we still are doing in a unique way for Jet. So I want to talk about two things, uh, physical stores and Sorry. fresh food. Uh, anyone okay. who has followed e-commerce for the last 20 years, like I, I'm just stunned that everyone that, yeah, stores, physical locations, bricks, brick and mortars back in fashion. Uh -huh. um, you know, do 
Might we see a Jet.com store, physical store one day? Um, I, I would never say never, because I, you know, after last year, I'd gotten out of the prediction business in all categories. Um, but, look, I think, to a certain extent, I think whether you sort of grown up as a brick and mortar retailer or grown up um, in e-commerce, I think the like day of the pure play is dead, right? That um, having presence both in the real world and the digital world is critical. There, are, I'm sure Why? there are some Why is it exceptions. a matter that there's a percentage of the buying public that just doesn't want to shop online? And I, I think I don't know this. I don't think there's a percentage of the buying public that doesn't want to shop online for anything. But I think there are many categories in which, you know, any given consumer will buy X online, but Y not. Um, I also think, I, I, we think about this a lot, even thinking about urban consumers, right? There's like a ballet of logistics that is modern urban living, right? So a package arriving early when there's no one there to sign for it is not helpful. In the same way that like if you, like me, have a, like I commute on a train every day, if it arrives and leaves two minutes early, I'm screwed because I, I am a just-in-time manufacturer for commuting. Um, and so I think similarly, consumers want that choice and they don't want companies' operational complexity to be thrust on them as the only way they can do business with them, right? And so whether it's, you know, people talk a lot about showrooming, I think that's a real thing. Um, Sometimes it is more convenient to stop on your drive home from work to pick things up than to have something delivered the next day. Um, I also think there's still things that people want to touch and feel and select on their own. Um, and businesses thinking they always know best for the consumer I don't think is a particularly useful value proposition. Um, and that's why I think that. But I think the physical world doesn't always have to be a brick and mortar store. So when you ask, like, could there someday be a jet store? Maybe. But um, if you look at some of the work Walmart has done, whether it's with towers or the IX boxes, um, there are lots of ways to do physical distribution. The towers are like a vending machine where you yeah. plug in your code and your, your cart comes down. Yeah, so, you know, I, I can picture a purple one of those and you know, the middle of Union Square, although that's terrible urban planning. I know, I wouldn't really do Seems that. Seems like there might be some objections to that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but I, I think um, a model that, and you see, you know, lots of examples of this, um, a model that suggests, like, the only way to interact with consumers is X um, is a little bit outdated in its thinking. Walmart's the largest retailer in the country. Uh, sorry, the lar yeah, the largest retailer, also the largest supermarket chain in the, in the country. But yeah. you guys are experimenting with produce. We are. Um, why? why? Uh, food is really important. And I say that not only as a Jewish mother, <laughs> um, but as a business person. Uh, when you think about the kinds of shopping that are truly habit forming, that cause people to move into this rinse and repeat relationship, um, food is central to that. Um, and we had been piloting in Fresh even before we got acquired um, and being part of you know, the, the country's largest grocer certainly gives us access to a quality of food at a price point that allows us to be able to deliver it to consumers um, with a lot of value, um, but also think about kind of the concentric circles for the primary household shopper you know, I, I use myself as a use case. I am just as often buying socks as I am buying milk um, for my kids and the ability to get those all. Maybe I don't want the socks wrapped around my milk, but I don't want to have the extra trip, whether it's to a website or to a store, to try and tackle both of those things. So is that still experimental at that point? At this point? No, we've been um, live and mm, I'm going to get the precise number wrong, but let's call it 1,200 zips mm -hmm. um, for a while, and the acquisition of Parcel um, recently has helped us think about um, kind of expediting delivery and maybe moving into things like attended delivery, which we haven't done So do, do you see a nationwide rollout? Uh, well, nationwide in the sense that in the markets we are focused on, we will go out, but I don't know that Again, we those will. jet, coastal, urban markets. Yeah, that's right. 
Uh, Target today acquired an Instacart competitor uh, called Shipped. Yeah. Uh, and it, it does. I read that. Yeah, it strikes me that there are sort of two models here on grocery delivery emerging. You know, one is the sort of let's syndicate uh, existing supermarkets, uh, deliver from the stores to people's homes. And then the other, which is, you know, maybe it started as more the Amazon uh, model, which is like kind of replicate an FC network, deliver, you know, from, from the back room to people's homes. Like, is that, you know, which, which model, which vision do you subscribe to? Um, well, and by, and we, shipped being an Instacart being let's let's partner with a lot of existing supermarkets. Yeah, I mean, I think clearly given the network and the assets available to us, we're we're kind of in in the other model. Yeah. We're not in the ship model, and I think for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it really leverages the assets we have at our, so we don't have to reinvent uh, things. Two, um, with the kind of power attendant in both supply chain and sourcing. Uh, we think we can just deliver a superior value proposition through that than we could um, otherwise. Um, and three, because it also allows us to, it is habit forming toward all of the, you know, 28 million odd other SKUs available on the site, it is habit forming to get people into more premium health and beauty. Um, other categories that are like baby clothes. There you see these concentric circles when you look at the data. Um, and so to the extent that we can see those adjacencies and ship those things together, again, there's benefit for us and there's a lot of benefit for the consumer. Um, you, you're, you might resist answering this at first, but I will ask it anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, Amazon. Way to sell yes, it. Yeah. You know, Amazon does seem in some quarters to be unstoppable these days. So um, where are they vulnerable? Oh, gosh. Um, that's a great question. I, there are a couple of places that I think, and when you look at, and I, I observe this as a consumer and I've read about it, when you look at like what has happened in Whole Foods since their acquisition, um, I think the consumer experience is really denigrated. I, of course, stopped shopping at Whole Foods once they got acquired by our major competitor because I just think you got to eat your own. Literally. Literally. Yep. Um, but I go in that store all the time, and I try and take up as much time of customer service people there as I can. Um, sorry. I probably shouldn't say that, but it's in my neighborhood. Um, and so I do think the, the, because they are, I mean, as someone famously said, the everything store, um, the potential impact to consumer experience, because I think part of why they've historically been so famous or so successful um, is their ability to deliver on a consistently good experience. Um, and at least what I see early days in this, and food is really, look, it's an important part of everybody's strategy, and if you fall down there, um, that certainly creates a vulnerability. Um, the other thing that I would say uh, creates a vulnerability is that, uh, you know, we're coming for them. Uh, Those are fighting words, yeah. Who would have thought that Walmart was the scrappy underdog right, right. in a two-horse race, but um, it sure feels like that. Well, it does seem like one uh, potential vulnerability would be, you know, that the, the big brands, they see Amazon's activities and white labeling and sure. the relentless price pressure. Uh, and, and, you know, they, some of them prefer, they want to control their own channels, prefer not to do business there. But you know, you mentioned earlier in the conversation that Jet could be a safe place for those brands. But you know, Walmart hasn't historically been one. Uh, so you know, how do you differentiate when you know Walmart is every bit the discounter uh, and the white labeler that Amazon is? Yeah. Look, I mean, it's actually it's funny um, when we got acquired. I'll tell you, one of our concerns was that brands that were on our platform that weren't historically on either Amazon or Walmart would um, be concerned. Um, and it just didn't happen. And in fact, what has happened is that a lot of premium brands have flocked to it um, because they kind of recognize, oh, we're going to get all of this great like supply chain and operational excellence, but have our brand kind of living with other brands like us in an environment from day one. Like from day one, we've honored map pricing. From day one, we've given brands the ability to like look at. Um, unauthorized resellers and take them off the platform and a host of other 
things, including access to you know, data about their sales that they haven't ever been able to get anyplace else, and we still do that. Um, and so I actually think it feels like a brand-friendly place inside of like a remarkably large, stable, successful company, and that's pretty compelling proposition if you're a brand, especially many of the brands that are trying to figure out their own e-commerce strategies. This is a, a great way to really enter. Voice shopping. My kids are now barking gift ideas at our Alexa. Mm. Um, where does, you know, where, where can that you guys... That delightful. Yes, I know, it's great. I just take them off. But <laughs> do you, is this the way people will shop? Uh, I think so, eventually. I mean, look, you've seen our partnership with Google Home. We're obviously excited about the space. I think if the big question is, is conversational commerce a thing, then I would say unequivocally yes. And when you just look even at, I mean, I have two teenagers, how they use their phones. They don't actually use them to talk to other humans very often. Um, at least mine don't. I actually, my oldest texted me from the back seat, Happy Mother's Day, <laughs> not that long ago. Very, I was like, very personal. Um, but so is the notion that you know consumers will use devices either like Google Home or just their mobile devices, um, but through voice as a key to shopping, I think yes. What the you know form factor that will emerge over time? Uh, see my early note about I don't make predictions, um, but I think that consumer behavior is real and gathering momentum. Are you guys at? I understand the the partnership with Google, uh, but are you guys at a disadvantage not owning the hardware and the customer experience? Um, I don't think so, but, and I will tell you, this is my Liza Landsman rogue employee point of view. I have believed fundamentally for a long time that the place you should invest your money and technology resources are on the things that you are either uniquely good at or uniquely required for your business. Um, and you should let other people who spend their whole R&D budgets advancing the technology. We are delighted. Um, to have great partners like Google on this front. You know, over time, if this moves from being a, an inchoate trend, then maybe that view would shift. Um, but I think, I don't think we're at a disadvantage. I actually think it allows us to kind of always be kind of on the leading edge. Uh, but are, When are we going to see the implementation on the Google Home device, and what kind of business do you expect it to generate? Um, I honestly don't remember. Okay. Um, I've just spent the last week looking at 47 different roadmaps, so I could make something up, <laughs> but I really don't remember. I won't press you. Okay, okay. Uh, we are going to play this uh, this game here: oh, uh, overhyped or underhyped. Oh God! Um, and I'm going to add a couple of my own twists to it. Fantastic. Um, some of these you guys will be familiar with from this morning: Bitcoin. Overhyped. Really? You don't, do you, does Jet.com ever accept Bitcoin uh, from? Uh, not unless we start selling on the dark web now. Okay. Uh, Facebook. Hmm. Hyped. Perfectly hyped. Are you an active it, user? Uh, I'm an active lurker. Okay. Um, uh. I here's the thing, right? So like all platforms, it can be used for good or evil. We've seen that. Yes. Uh, right. And we've certainly seen that in spades. I think the ability to find connectivity at that scale is really powerful. Um, and so, you know, if harnessed mostly for good, I, I, I still think, you know, hyped. Um, you know, certainly some of the challenges that we've all, you know, been familiar with are very real. And I also think broadly, not unique to Facebook, I worry as a human, as a parent, about how social media is informing the nature of human interaction. Um, I'm not sure that it has lived up to its mission to actually bring in communities together. Not yet. Not Work, yet. Working on that but part. I live in anticipation. Uh, E-commerce, hyped or underhyped or overhyped? Hmm. I'm going to say underhyped, but I'm going to put an asterisk on that, which is see my earlier note about the death of the pure play. Um, I have a rule for my team that anybody who uses the expression omni-channel more than twice in a conversation gets stabbed in the throat with a rusty spoon. 
Because I typically find that it is a signal that the person doesn't really know what they're talking about because it's just so like gloriously unspecific. Um, but I do think that the world is moving in a way where you have to operate as if like the channels are fluid and that you can provide that level of control back to the consumer. And so e-commerce as an enabler of that, probably underhyped. Okay, three more quick ones. Overhyped or underhyped? Amazon Prime. <sighs> That's just mean. Uh, oh, golly. Can I decline to answer yeah, on the sure. grounds that I am sure. a fan of gainful employment? Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Drone delivery? Uh, drone delivery, overhyped. Okay. And uh, uh, robots in fulfillment centers? Underhyped. Okay. Liza Lansman, thank you. Thank you so much.